Welcome to Evolution of Self with me, Britannia. Hello. So last week I spoke about processing the emotions of grief. But um, I've had a crazy week since last week with even more emotions. Um, I'll just give you a brief synopsis of what I've been through. So there is this person who I love very, very dearly, who is quite critically ill. And there's the sadness and everything around that, which I spoke about in last week's video. And I'll put a link to that in the show notes below, along with everything else I speak about. But then over the last week, so I decided they actually live in a different country. So I decided that I was going to go out and visit them and spend some time and support those around them. And so there was all the sort of stress, I suppose, of international travel during a COVID epidemic and all the things that you need to get together to do that and everything else. And then on top of that, <laughs> my son, who's staying with my brother and my sister-in-law in Southern Africa, um, happened to be visiting with this person who's not very well and they were on their way back to Botswana when um, they got back two positive coronavirus tests so and my son was one of the positive ones so then there was the anxiety around that and then they went and got retested and it ended up being a false positive because they and then all came back negative so then that was a relief and then they arrived back home only for the borders in South Africa to be closed and for my whole travel plans to be completely put to, to bed. So, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is because this week I want to share, because there was something I forgot to mention last week and it's about emotions and specifically last week I was talking about grief, but this actually applies to any intense emotions you are going through. And having gone through quite a lot of very intense emotions over the last week, I can attest to having used this tool quite extensively. So what I'm sharing with you is that this particular tool, it's about, um, it's exactly, you do what I shared with you last week about breathing into the emotions. And as I said, reference that video for all those details. I'm not going to go into them now. But specifically, it's about... Um, becoming the observer of your emotions. So I'm going to start by explaining how you do this with your thoughts. So to learn how to do this, if you've never done it before, just notice the thoughts that you're thinking and almost see them as this stream of thoughts that go through your head. And it's quite weird because when you focus in on a thought, it's like you're suddenly plugging into it and you suddenly go into it and it's it, it takes up all of your awareness and all of your capacity for anything. But if you step back a little bit and you say to yourself, ah, I'm thinking, and I'm going to reference what I've been thinking over the last week because it's obviously there in my mind. Um, I'm thinking about traveling. I'm thinking about um, this person I love who's not well. I'm thinking about uh, my son who might have COVID in another country. And, and it's, you can kind of step back and see that you there's a part of you that's doing the thinking, but there's also a part of you that can observe this part of you doing the thinking. And that part of you is the observer. Um, I kind of see it as the true self, the soul, the higher self, whatever you want to call it. But there's a part of you that is observing the thinking. And the same is true with emotions. And as soon as you start observing that, say, like for me, I, I was stressed, I was sad, I was excited because I actually might have got to see my son who I don't know when I'm going to see him again. And not to mention my brother and my sister-in-law and my niece and my nephew, who I haven't seen, goodness, in two years or more. Um, so there were so many emotions. But as if I stepped back from them, if I kind of um, observed myself feeling those feelings, the feelings didn't become less intense. I could feel them in my body, but I wasn't living them, if that makes any sense. It's the difference between watching a movie, a really good movie, where you feel all the anxiety and the thrill and the drama of whatever it is you're watching and you physically feel it, and then suddenly reminding yourself that actually it's a movie and you don't need to necessarily feel everything as intensely as you would if you were believing that you were actually in it. And the same goes for the emotions. So I think that's a very key thing um, in regards to dealing with grief, but not just grief, any intense emotions, is learning to be the observer. 
and then doing what I spoke about last week about the breathing and things like that. But that is observer part is key because as soon as you can observe yourself feeling something, then you kind of have much more control over how you deal with it. And it sort of doesn't become your reality. It just becomes something you're experiencing. Now, the second part of this particular little episode today is about, so last week I mentioned the five stages of grief, but I didn't go into them in detail. And again, I'm not actually going to get into them in detail, but I will touch on them today. And um, I'm just going to get my copy, just hang on a second, to make sure I get them all in order. This particular methodology was designed by a lady called Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and um, she spent a lot of time around critically ill patients. And this was came from her obser observations. Now, the one key thing I want you to know is although there's five stages of grief, it doesn't mean that you will go through each one of them in turn in the same way that everyone else will go through them. It's, it's not a linear process. And if you do the things that I've spoken about, you might find that you miss some of those particular steps. I'm not promising that because um, I, I haven't done it with enough people to know that it would definitely be the case. But I know that in my own case, um, both when my brother passed and through other experiences I've had, um, I don't tend to go through the same steps that most people do. Um, for instance, I very rarely hit anger. Um, there is there is definitely a bit of denial originally. <laughs> Let me just tell you what the steps are quickly so that I can make sure I get them all right. So there's denial, anger, and I'm reading, so I'm sorry, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. So I suppose using the processes that I've shared with you and knowing the things that I know that I share through all of my videos and my courses, I, I don't tend to go through anger so much. I don't do the bargaining step, steps either. The depression, which is linked to sadness, definitely I feel that, um, but it, I don't get stuck there. Um, it's like with the emotions that I was speaking about. It's an emotion I feel, I breathe through it, I disas well, not disassociate, but I observe myself feeling it. And it shifts and moves quite quickly. And acceptance comes very quickly um, through my experiences of what I've been going through. Now, the reason I'm sharing this with you is, one, to share that it's not a linear process, that it's not something that everybody experiences in the same way, that anyone should experience in the same way. So as I said in last week's episode as well, never expect somebody to experience grief or process it. There is no shoulds and shouldn'ts. It's just what you're experiencing. But the last thing that I want to share with you, which is something that I heard in, I think it was a Brené Brown podcast, and if I can find it, I will also put it in the show notes below because it was actually a really interesting particular episode that I listened to. And this was with a guy called David Kessler. And he worked with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross until she passed. And I think they created a book together before she passed, including this sixth stage of grief. And I just thought this was really interesting. And it also links to another book called Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. And it's, I, I just, I've always loved that book. And I just think it's so full of amazing insights into human nature. He survived two concentration camps during the Second World War and ended up going on to be, I think it was a psychologist. And this was one of the books that he wrote from some of the experiences he had and the insights he gained through it. And one of the things that he talks about is how important meaning is and that he noticed during his time in these concentration camps that the people that tended to survive the concentration camps were people who had a purpose, had meaning in their life. And it's really interesting because what Elizabeth Kubler-Ross and David Kessler have also realised is that the people that survive grief the best, the people that manage to move past it and live fulfilling lives, are the ones that find meaning in that loss. And it doesn't necessarily mean loss of a person in your life, although it could. Um, it could be the loss of a job, the loss of a relationship, the loss of anything. Um, once we find meaning in it, then it, it sort of, it's almost honouring whatever it was that you've experienced, honouring the relationship, honouring the person, honouring whatever it is that you've done in your life. And what I wanted to share with you is around my, my brother passing, um, I think that's one of the reasons why, I mean, I miss him. I'm not saying that that missing, that sadness goes away completely, but I have a lot of peace around it. And I think that peace is for me, the meaning that I got from it was our family has always loved each other, but we were quite blasé about it. And we, 
I suppose we took each other for granted because until that point, I'd never lost anyone in my entire life. All my grandparents were still alive when my brother passed. So it's not like I'd ever experienced loss of any kind at all in, that re in regards to people in my life in that way. But when my brother passed, instead of us um, pulling away from each other as a family, we pulled together. And for me, the meaning that I gained from that particular experience was just how important family is. Um, and family to me now is incredibly important, especially going through what we've been going through at the moment. It rem it's a reminder um, of the love, of the connection, of making that time for each other and caring about each other and the safe space that we create for each other. And, and I suppose that's the meaning for me that I've chosen to take. And I think that's the important part. It's not about sitting there and waiting for someone to tell you what the meaning is. You have to kind of figure out what the meaning is for you. You create that meaning. Um, and it doesn't have to be like for me, it was the sort of the family, the connection, the love that we share and telling each other and sharing it and being open about it. Um, it can be, if you're, I'm talking about grief and losing a person, but I mean, as I said, apply it to any grief or anything lost that you're going through. Um, it could be um, setting up a foundation or changing a behaviour or doing something. There's another um, book that I read. Sorry, today's episode is all about books. <laughs> Put all of the links in the notes below. This one was Many Lives, Many Masters. And it was by, I think it was Dr. Brian Weiss. And I saw, always, there's two people I get confused, so I hope I'm saying the right name, but I will put the right name in the show notes. And um, I mean, I found it fascinating because it was about past lives, um, but it was also, he, he didn't believe in past lives until he started doing this sort of regression work with um, his, his patients. And he talks about how he lost one of his sons um, when he was really, really young. Um, I think he was only a few months old or a few years old when he lost him and how it changed what he had chosen to do with his life. So I think until that point, he wanted to be a medical doctor. And then I think after his son passed, he chose to be um, a psychologist. And through the process of past life regression and things like that, he realised that if his son had not passed, he would have gone on and done something completely different. So the meaning that that gave to him was that his son's passing had changed the complete course of his life. Um, and I'm not saying it has to be as drastic as that, but I just really wanted to share it with you because it felt really important. And I hope that in some way it helps you or someone you know, or touches someone's lives in some way. So much love from me to you. And if you're going through some kind of loss, my thoughts, my prayers are with you. Um, as I've said, there are going to be lots of links this week in the show notes. Um, I'll also put links to my website and the courses that I'm doing. And if you're listening to this fairly sort of as to when it's been released, then I am also going to be doing a abundance manifestation mini course, a free one in the next couple of weeks. And I will continue to do it throughout the year or the years sort of onwards. So if you have missed this one, click on and subscribe to the next one and I will see you next week. Lots and lots of love. Bye bye.